Hi, everyone. My name is Sangeeta Bhatia. I'd like to thank the organizers for including me in the session today. I'm going to be telling you about the field of nanomedicine. Um, and the title of my talk is It's a Small World Where Nanotechnology Meets Medicine. Hopefully, I'll be able to convey to you why this is such an exciting area and give you a glimpse of some of the opportunities that I think are coming in the future. These are my requisite disclosures. And now I'll begin. So this may be an image that's somewhat familiar to you. It's meant to convey the fact that we can now fit a billion transistors on the same footprint where one fit just a few decades ago. This enormous progress has been driven by our interest in speeding computation and team science approaches between material scientists, physicists, engineers, um, and many others. And that kind of team science has been incredibly inspiring and really has led to portable computation and changed all of our lives. What I'd like to tell you about today is how some of these advances have been merged with biomedical research uh, to change really the current and future landscape of medicine. So if we take a step back and ask sort of how did we do that? How did we get so small? We can sort of see on this time scale that back in the 1960s, we had a mainframe computer. In 1981, we had the first IBM computer. Really in the year 2000, which is around the time that I graduated graduate school, uh, we actually got to feature sizes on silicon that were less than 100 nanometers. That was really ushering in this moment of nanotechnology. And what's really exciting about that length scale is that actually that is the length scale at which biology works. Um, and I'll show you that on the next slide. So that really became an opportunity where we could start to marry nanotechnology and medicine. Of course, uh, this engineering field progressed then. You see in 2007 that we now have smartphones with 90 nanometer nodes. And in 2020, uh, we can now fit 11.8 billion transistors um, in these same uh, devices. So we've made incredible progress through this miniaturization. And we had this real break point in the year 2000. Now, if we take that sort of length scale and we say, what is 100 nanometers? In the biological world, we look at a, a human hair, which is about 100 microns. So we're about a thousand times smaller than a human hair. Uh, and on the right here, you see that have we emerge in parallel to that sort of silicon technology, been a whole bunch of nanomaterials that have emerged that are really right around this length scale. So liposomes, dendromers, gold nanoparticles, and so on and so forth. And they are actually the exquisite size to match biology. So a single receptor is 10 nanometers, a single cell is 10 microns. Now we have materials that basically can communicate with biology on the relevant length scale. So what I'd like to do is tell you how that's enabling in a very specific context of cancer. Um, I hope you'll see uh, through this example that actually the, the, the implications are much broader than cancer. But let's just start with a really sort of focused medical problem, um, which is in our society today, which is cancer care. Uh, and think about how miniaturization to that length scale can really be enabling. So here we look at um, really a patient journey in cancer, um, all the way from uh, early risk assessment to early detection, to making a diagnosis, to treatment, and then monitoring that patient for recurrence. Uh, and what we know uh, about cancer today is that in the early detection domain, if we can find cancers earlier, they are more able to be cured. Um, we see the data here in this piece from The Economist across a wide, wide, wide variety of tumors, uh, that earlier detection leads to better survival. Um, and in spite of that knowledge, really the tools that we have today are quite limited. We have imaging and screening technologies and things like pap smear that appear under a microscope. Uh, so one starts to think about how could we do better in early detection? And in fact, there is a field emerging known as the liquid biopsy field. Um, in this field, what people do is they take blood tests, blood samples, um, and they look in the blood for things that the cancer may have shed into the circulation. You see a wide variety of them listed at the bottom of our screen. 
Okay, so what we've been doing in trying to, instead of detecting things in the bloodstream that the cancer sheds, we've been making nanomaterials that can actually enter into the body. You see them here, these nanoscale materials. They're about 50 nanometers in diameter in this example. They're exiting blood vessels and leaking into tumors, early tumors. And these tumors are making enzymes. And the enzymes here show up as little yellow balls on the screen. And these enzymes are so that the cancer can break out of the tissue in which they're born um, and migrate and invade. And what we do is we make these nanomaterials sensors for those enzymes. And the nanomaterials have been designed um, because we have the material science to be able to do this to amplify a signal. So one encounter with an enzyme can release about a thousand of these little blue balls in an hour. And these little blue balls now can enter the circulation and we can take advantage of another remarkable nanoscale feat in biology. And that is that the kidney is a five nanometer filter. So these little blue balls go into the kidney and they get concentrated by the kidney, all that five liters of blood, uh, 20 fold concentration, and they end up in the urine. So the way this nanoscale sensor works is you deliver it in the body, it enters into the tumor, it's activated, it releases a reporter, and that reporter gets concentrated in the urine after about an hour. And this allows us to detect chemical reactions and enzymes deep inside the body, inside tumors, that would not have been shed in the bloodstream and measured in a sort of conventional so-called liquid biopsy format. And our vision then, as you can imagine, now instead of needing a mammogram infrastructure or a colonoscopy infrastructure or pap smear infrastructure for cancer screening, you could imagine that you could do a shot of these nanomaterials. You could wait for one hour and then you could do a urine test. And what we've been working on in our group is making that urine test a simple test, like a paper test, like a pregnancy test. So you do a shot, you wait an hour, you do a paper test, um, and you're able to detect cancer much earlier than you could today without all of that infrastructure. Um, and one starts to imagine that really one could implement cancer screening um, outside the hospital setting, uh, even potentially globally. So we're really excited about the potential for nanotechnology to change the landscape of cancer detection and save more lives. The way we've done this now um, and taking this forward is through a startup. This is a one common approach to taking new technologies into the world. So they're born in academic labs with federal support, um, like the kind that the NNI has created. And then they need to be taken out into the world. And so here what you see is the formulation that's being taken forward through a startup where we have 16 of these probes together injected into the liver and coming out in this urine test. Um, and in fact, we've done this many, many times for many, many diseases. And I'll skip sort of um, all the, the details of the science, except for to say that in this lung cancer example, you can see in this curve, a perfect predictor of cancer is when the area under the curve is one. And you can see we're doing really quite well um, in these mice with lung cancer, detecting lung cancer very early. Um, and if you compare this test to something um, like one of those blood biopsy, liquid biopsy biomarkers, you can see you can do about 100 times better uh, than those other methodologies. And one starts to think then about what else you could do. So if you can deliver this probe and you could take it into the tumor and you could detect it early in the urine, you may not even need infrastructure. Um, what would the physician want to do next? Well, then you would want to visualize the tumor so that you could assess whether one could do surgery or you could pick a therapeutic option. Um, and so here what we've done is actually invent a next generation of these probes where we actually can load them with radioactivity that can be imaged. So in this setting, you would say the urine test turned positive. Now, where is the tumor? And here we're doing what's called a PET scan um, using the same materials that have been loaded with uh, a, a PET uh, a PET label called copper 64. Um, 
These are being taken forward into patients. Um, they have been now deemed safe in a phase one clinical trial. So we're really excited now to be able to think about um, all the applications where one could use these nanomaterials as synthetic biomarkers or make your own biomarkers for diseases um, even beyond cancer. So thinking about things like infectious disease, for example. Okay, so I've told you how materials at the nanoscale might be able to address this landscape of cancer by helping us detect and diagnose diseases earlier when they're more treatable and maybe even visualize them. Um, the next thing I'd like to think about with you is how nanomaterials might actually be able to change treatment responses. So here we think about how is cancer commonly treated today? We know that you, you can use chemotherapy, radiation. We're in an era of so-called precision medicine where we have targeted small molecules that target specific pathways in cancer. Uh, we have some remarkable cures that have come up in the field of immunotherapy where we can give antibodies that unblock T cells so that they can kill cancers. Um, and also we can weaponize T cells themselves so they can kill cancer. So we have an incredible armamentarium of tools um, at our disposal. And in spite of this, of course, many cancers today are still not curable. Um, but one thing that you don't see here is an RNA medicine for cancer. So for those of you who are not experts, you'll remember that DNA makes RNA makes protein. So RNA actually itself has the potential to be a drug uh, in the year of 2020, we all know, uh, 2021, I guess, we all know this because the new uh, COVID vaccines are actually RNA medicines. So if we look at that kind of historically in the same way that I showed you the history of the material science of uh, transistor miniaturization. We see this here, we see again, starting back in 1960, uh, the very first moments where mRNA was discovered uh, so this was that uh, IBM computer that I showed you on the last slide. And in parallel during that time, advances have been happening in biology, just as miniaturization technologies have been advanced. So in 1993 was the first use of RNA as a vaccine in animals. Um, in 1998, a first RNA therapy was approved. This is for an eye disease. Um, in 2010, this was um, was uh, attempted for cancer, where RNA could be used, RNA interference could be used to knock down a protein uh, in cancer. Uh, and then we saw the first approvals of RNA medicines uh, from a company called Elnylam in 2018. Uh, and then I had to um, happily update the slide uh, just this week to show, of course, that the two first COVID-19 vaccine approvals in the U.S., which happened kind of remarkably in 11 to 12 months from the first sequences, were actually RNA medicines. So it's been a remarkable time for RNA biology, just the way it's been a remarkable time for semiconductor miniaturization. And in spite of that, 20 years since the first FDA approval, we do not have an RNA drug for cancer therapy. So we're building off of these enormous infrastructural advances, um, but cancer is not quite there yet. Um, so what I'd like to show you is I think that there is potential uh, to impact this space as well. So why is treating cancer hard? Uh, one of the reasons is that if you give drugs uh, into the bloodstream, they don't get into tumors. Um, so here's an example where uh, this is a fluorescent drug, a fluorescein that's been administered to a mouse with a pancreatic tumor. Um, and you can see that tumor transport limits the entry into the tumor. Um, this is another example of a metastatic nodule, so a, a tumor that's spread. And again, you can see here that the green dye is not entered into the tumor. Uh, so this is a problem for all drugs but it's an even bigger problem for RNA medicines um, because RNA is actually a charged molecule uh, that can be degraded in the bloodstream and then has trouble crossing cell membranes. So as bad as it is for this drug in this image, it's even worse for RNA medicines in spite of all of their promise. So 
does nanotechnology have something to offer this field? In fact, if you package RNA medicines inside nanomaterials, you can overcome many of those limitations. And that is in fact exactly how the two COVID-19 mRNA nano packaged vaccines work. Um, so here we're talking about doing the same thing for cancer. And so you can see here that there's RNA cargo that's been packaged inside a nanomaterial um, that has a couple of different properties. It allows this to home in on the tumor. It allows it to get inside the cell and then inside the right compartment of the cell for the RNA to be active. Uh, so we did this work in collaboration with Erki Wuslati, and we were funded by one of the early CCNEs uh, from the NCI, the Cancer Center of Nanotechnology Excellence um, at UCSD, um, and also at, at MIT and Harvard. Uh, so the way these work is you administer them again in the bloodstream, and you can see them here kind of next to these red blood cells, and they get activated at the site of the tumor. They get activated by enzymes, and we've been talking about enzymes. They bind the blood vessel cells, they get activated, they bind to another receptor, which is called a neuropillin 1. They get inside the cells of interest, they get outside a compartment of the cell that traps them called the endosome, and then they can, the RNA can do its job. So in this particular case, the RNA is a silencing RNA, and it's going to turn down a protein of interest in the tumor. Okay, so we call these tumor penetrating nanoparticles. We made them, as I said, together with Erki Ruslati and a colleague, Mike Saylor. This is for the chemists in the crowd, um, a fancier version of the structure of these where they package silencing RNA. And you can imagine that this is actually um, a very modular technology. So we've applied this to lots of different tumors in animals so far. Um, and this is just an example of, again, that same green dye that I was showing you earlier. Now the green dye is on the RNA molecule, and you can see on the right-hand side kind of a control mouse. This is what happens inside the tumor when you give this drug. Basically, you shouldn't see any. Um, when you use this tumor-activating pathway, you can see just after three hours that it's pouring into the tumor and lining that tumor up green. And we did this collaboratively with colleagues at the Broad Institute and the Tadina Farber Institute, Bill Hahn. Uh, we were able to see that if we silenced a particular gene here called ID4, which is a transcription factor that's hard to drug, uh, that you could get survival improvement of mice with ovarian cancer that was quite dramatic. You can see here this red line. And this was dependent on being able to penetrate the tumor and also dependent on having the right RNA cargo that silenced the right gene. Um, so this has all been very exciting, and you could start to think about what else can you deliver with a platform like this. Um, RNA is charged, but so is mRNA, like we've been talking about the COVID-19 vaccine, and so is DNA. Um, and so, in fact, you can use the same platform to deliver immunostimulatory DNA. And this is a picture of a, um, a, a tumor that was immunostimulated with a cargo like that. And so that when you give one of those immunotherapy drugs that are so exciting but don't work on everybody, you can potentiate them and get them to work better. And that's what you're looking at here, um, potentiated shrinkage of this particular tumor type, which is a melanoma. Um, you can also actually look at tumors like pancreatic cancer, which are very hard to treat. Again, here you're looking at that same green dye pouring into a pancreatic cancer and silencing a gene that's present in over 90% of can pancreatic cancer called KRAS, um, which has a lot of exciting potential therapeutic opportunity. Uh, and finally, even in infectious diseases, like again, we've been talking about viral pneumonias here. This is a bacterial pneumonia where we're using these same nanomaterials, um, a different formulation that was done together with Mike Saylor, where we use porous silicon so it's different, actually the same silicon that we use uh, for semiconductor manufacturing, but it's made porous. Um, and here what we've done is silence genes that are involved with the inflammation of pneumonia. Because as you've probably been hearing in the press, um, inflammation actually can be just as harmful as the viral infection itself. So here we silence the inflammatory pathways, and you can see that these mice are actually, 100% of them are saved. Um, 
uh, from the pneumonia. And this is not targeting the bacteria at all. It's actually targeting the inflammatory response in the lungs. So the simple platform can package modularly many different RNAs and potentially address uh, not just cancer, but infectious diseases. Um, Okay, so I've shown you a couple of different examples in cancer, thinking about uh, detecting diseases and then treating diseases and how packaging things at that nanoscale really can transform the way we think about it and the, the sort of landscape of potential opportunities uh, for, for physicians. And if you just sort of take a step back and say, like, what enabled that? Really, it's the convergence of all these disciplines over the time scales that I've been talking to you about. So we started back in the 1960s, and I've shown you that the miniaturization technologies came together really with the nucleic acid therapies, maybe starting in the year 2000, when we'll say, let's say, nanotechnology was born. There are many other fields of basic research that have had um, steady investment from the federal government, from universities, from our private sector, um, and that have fed into this convergence moment and we really are poised to transform the future of not just cancer, but infectious disease, and I would argue even uh, healthcare in uh, low and middle income countries. So we can start to imagine that these technologies can change really how we think about, about medicine broadly. What do we need to sort of take that forward into the future? Well, we need new groups of people talking together. Um, and this is just one example of the kinds of things that are happening now. So this was uh, a think tank meeting that was convened at the NCI by myself and Sam Gambier, who was a remarkable researcher uh, at Stanford who we sadly lost, um, and, uh, and some amazing NCI administrators. And um, this was a syndicate meeting called Synthetic Biomarkers for Detection of Cancers at Incipient and Early Stages. So this idea that you can make the body make signals that you can detect early, uh, even though that they don't occur naturally. Um, we spent two days together at this think tank meeting, and there's a summary paper coming out soon um, in the literature to describe kind of bringing together all different kinds of people together with physicians and um, the NIH to think about these problems. So we need um, our federal agencies to take chances on some of these new ideas. We also need that really basic high risk research that comes from engineers and physicists and life scientists and physicians talking to each other. So at MIT, we do that through a center that I run uh, called the Cancer Nanomedicine Center, the Marvel Center for Cancer Nanomedicine. You can see here our, um, our remarkable faculty and amongst us we have 200 trainees. Uh, that are constantly um, bumping into each other by design and by accident uh, to come up with new ideas uh, for cancer. Um, and we fund, you know, high risk, high impact ideas in the center. Uh, and then the last thing we need really is diverse talent uh, to drive this, this, this really next phase of innovation and impact. Um, and in that regard, we do a number of things to try and diversify the pipeline of talent in our field. Um, here, this is an outreach activity that's for middle school girls. This happened to be my two daughters uh, coming into MIT called, in an activity called Keys to Empowering Youth. Uh, this is a set of postdocs that are training, cross-training um, outside of their research area to become leaders, uh, whether that's in translational research, entrepreneurship, policy, science communication. Uh, this is something that we call the Convergence Scholars Program, where we work with them individually, a class of six of them every year, um, on enhancing those skills to make them uh, leaders. Uh, this is a social media campaign that myself and two department heads at MIT participated in, Angela Belcher and Paula Hammond. Um, amazing colleagues, you can see, hashtag I look like an engineer to change perceptions of what engineering is uh, in our society. This is an art project that we actually did out of the Media Lab um, together with a former postdoc who's now on the faculty at Columbia, again, to change the conversation around vaccination. These are actually micro-patterned cells using photolithographic techniques that have been infected with a virus uh, that's used for a vaccine to show really what the level of precision is in, in today's modern medicine. 
Uh, and finally, I uh, encourage everyone at our center and all of you to continue to talk to the public about the work that we do because it's so important and so exciting. We really need to spend the time and energy to think about simplifying our work without stripping it of its content in formats that um, can engage the best and the brightest uh, for the next generation of inventions and innovations uh, that will leverage nanotechnology and bring it into the future. So with that, I hope I've convinced you that the future is small and the impact is big. And I will thank the, uh, um, the organizers for inviting me and everybody who's contributed to this work uh, that you see here and, um, and you for your time. Thank you.